non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in children and adolescents. So this was a 14-year-old girl who presented to the emergency department with um, intermittent abdominal pain that has been going on for months. She presented on that day because the pain was more severe, localized to the right side. On taking history, she was found to have altered bowel habits, had a diagnosis in the past of ADHD and Tourette's for which she was having medications. She also had mild asthma, her periods were regular, and apart from being on the antidepressants and the ADHD medications, nothing uh, of significance. And there was a family history of diabetes type 2. On assessing the child, she was overweight with a BMI of 40. She had stria, acanthosis, nigrans, but abdominal palpation was difficult because of her body habitus, but they didn't find any tenderness. They did some blood tests um, as part of the investigations, including liver function tests, and that revealed in elevated ALT and AST, as you can see. So they referred her to the hepatology clinic. So they referred her with uh, these abnormal LFTs for assessment. We get this referral many times, and I'm sure you come across a similar case um, every, uh, quite often in your clinics. And the question is, obesity, abnormal LFTs. Is this nothing or is it not? And when can we say that this is nothing? So I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll have a, a better idea on which cases that you should consider and what investigations and when to refer to the specialist. So nothing is defined as accumulation of fat in the liver, more than 5% of hepatocytes in the absence of um, alcohol consumption or alcoholic liver disease and any other liver condition. It is recognized now as the most common cause of chronic liver disease, both in children and in adults. And it is one of the leading causes of liver transplantation in adults. It's associated with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia. It has a range of liver presentation from simple uh, accumulation of uh, uh, liver fat to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which I'll be referring to as NASH, up to a variable degrees eventually of fibrosis and cirrhosis. The prevalence um, or epidemiological data on prevalence of nephilim in children um, is quite um, scarce. However, uh, the overall prevalence is around 3 to 10% of children worldwide. This varies by uh, race and for example, it was found to be very common in um, South America, Middle East, compared to Africa, for example. It also varies by the method of detection. So if we can see from the, uh, uh, this figure in the paper by the Italian group, if the method of detection was um, the uh, ALT, for example, in Australia, the prevalence was slightly lower than if they diagnosed nephilim by ultrasound. Similarly, in Iran, uh, the diagnosis based on ALT would pick up less cases uh, than if by the ultrasound. Next. However, the overall uh, uh, prevalence has been increasing over the last few years, and maybe that's because we are recognizing it more and looking for it more. And generally in children younger than 10 years, the prevalence is uh, less than adolescents, but in obese uh, children, it's up to 40%. Nafilt is considered as a multifactorial disease with a, a substantial genetic component. And I will go over the genetics on later slides. It's more common in male, in children with high uh, BMIs and increased weight circumference. It is associated with uh, metabolic syndrome, as I've mentioned, and obstructive sleep apneas. There is a higher risk of developing nephilim in children who have family history of nephilim or obesity or type 2 diabetes. Low birth weight combined with early catch-up growth is a risk factor for nephilim. And however, the breastfeeding is protected. Diet increases the risk of nephilim, specifically high fructose uh, intake. And as I've mentioned before, ethnicity and race. Hispanic being Hispanic puts you at 
four times the risk of developing nothing. So as I mentioned, the diet um, of high fructose intake can increase the, the risk of nephod and it contributes to the disease because it promotes the lipogenesis, production of uric acid, uh, visceral adiposity and decreasing insulin sensitivity. Another reason the fructose can alter intestinal microbiome and I will discuss later the role of intestinal microbiome on the development of this disease. So children having a lot of sugary drinks and the Pepsi and Cokes, the, this is obviously putting them at increased risk. So several studies have shown that single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in the genes responsible for insulin sensitivity, lipid metabolism, um, have a role in the uh, pathogenesis or development of steatosis and the progression of the disease. One of the most common um, variants is the PNPLA3 uh, polymorphism or variant. Interestingly, it's an allele that's found more commonly in Hispanics, which might explain why they have more predisposition to NAFTA. It encodes a transmembrane protein called um, adiponutrin, and it is found uh, predominantly in, expressed predominantly in um, fatty tissues. The uh, variant uh, PNP uh, LA3 appears to me to be of relevance in the development of NAFLD in non obese population. So it's not only obesity that's causing the nephilim because there is a genetic predisposition. If you come across a child who has a picture of nephilim and is not obese, it's worth doing this gene. Other uh, polymorphisms or genetic variants uh, that, was, uh, that were studied is the TM6S52 uh, and uh, the variant of this uh, uh, gene causes impairment in the uh, very low density lipoprotein secretions and increase in uh, intrahepatic triglyceride accumulation. The glucokinase regulatory protein, uh, and this results in unrestrained lipogenesis. And finally, the MBOA T7, uh, which results in altering the remodeling of phospholipids. What about the role of microbiome? Several studies have demonstrated that there is a specific intestinal microbiota signature in children with nothing, where there is an increase in the bacteriotidis and decrease in thermocytes in the obese and children who have NASH compared to children who are healthy uh, with normal liver. Also, um, children who have NASH were found to have more alcohol producing strains with higher blood um, ethanol. So the alteration in the intestinal microbiome might contribute actually to the development of NAFLD and could be used as a marker for a disease um, monitoring or severity of the disease. So how do, um, or what's the presentation or clinical picture of NAFLD? As I mentioned before, it's part of the uh, uh, metabolic uh, disease with insulin resistance, um, obesity, abnormal cholesterol levels, and children with NAFLD, they have higher fasting is insulin and higher glucose levels than children with obesity at all. Next. The presentation is usually non-specific as the case I presented earlier. So um, uh, fatigue, abdominal pain, usually on the right side, or routine blood tests and uh, the abnormal LFTs are um, detected. On examination, we can find hepatomegaly if we can examine these children uh, despite their body habitus. Acanthosis nigrans, which is a marker of, marker of hyperinsulinemia, and it has been observed in nearly half of the children with nephilim. Waist circumference is an important anthropometric measure in children with uh, uh, nephilim uh, and it can be used in assessing the disease and disease progression. And some studies have shown that for every five centimeters increase in the waist circumference, there is an odd ratio of 1.4 of uh, predicting ultrasonography steatosis picture.
there are insufficient data to predict which children are at risk of rapid disease progression, but it's known that pediatric nephint is more severe compared to adult nephint, and that children, about 15% of them, present with um, liver fibrosis at stage three or higher at the time of presentation. Screening, um, shall we, should we screen for uh, nephint? Again, like most of the screening tests, this is controversial. Um, but why should we screen for nephilim? Because picking up nephilim and treating it early, there is a, a, a possibility that we can refer, uh, reverse the nephilim and even the steatum hepatitis if we intervene early. Who should we target? The at-risk group, children who are obese with evidence of insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and those are over 10 years of age as recommended by Nespina. What is the best screening tool? Do we do blood tests? Do we do uh, uh, imaging? Transaminases. So checking for ALT and AST is easy and it can be done and it is recommended. ALT more than twice upper limit of normal of the gender specific can be used for screening. But we have to bear in mind the levels for ALT and AST because it varies from one lab to the other and varies by age. But according to the screening ALT for elevation in today's youth study, or what they call safety study, the normal values for ALT and AST that we use in children is set too high to detect liver steatosis. And they found that the uh, ALT levels in healthy children with normal liver should be around 22 milligrams per deciliter for girls and 26 for boys. We could use ultrasound um, for screening, but it's not, um, it, the sensitivity and specificity is low. And also MRI to detect liver steatosis, but this is not practical in children, um, expensive, and cannot be, it's not available in all uh, centers. So for diagnosing nephint, we have to uh, first establish the diagnosis of hepatic steatosis or presence of fat in the liver, which is the, the, what nephint is. Hepatic fibrosis, which is the complications for, uh, of nephilim, but more importantly, excluding any other liver disease. So lab tests uh, or uh, investigations to do, as I mentioned, the ALT and uh, using the cutoff levels of 22 and 25. GGT, elevated GGT represents the risk factor for uh, developing fibrosis. Doing metabolic um, uh, tests and tests to exclude other liver diseases. This is a list of the laboratory tests as recommended by the SPGAN working group in the SPGAN position paper published in 2012. Again, as you can see, in addition to liver function tests and liver synthetic functions, lipid profile, there is a long list of tests to do primarily to exclude any other liver condition. What about the role of imaging? So imaging to diagnose steatosis, ultrasound, easy, safe, available, demonstrating a hyperechoic bright liver compared to the kidneys and spleen is indicative of um, nephilim. But the limitation of that is that it's not very accurate if liver steatosis is less than 30%. However, it's useful to evaluate for portal hypertension and other liver diseases. What about MRI in evaluating steatosis? There is MRI spectroscopy and MRI protein density fat fraction or MRI PDFF, which is accurate in hepatic fat quantification and provides mapping for uh, the entire liver. And it can also uh, grade the degree of hepatic steatosis. Imaging role in uh, diagnosing of fibrosis. So transient elastography or fibrous scan has been validated to predict the presence of uh, moderate to severe fibrosis in pediatric nephilim. Uh, liver stiffness measurements of seven, between seven to nine KPA is um, useful to predict fibrosis of stage one to two. Values of more than nine KPA are associated with advanced fibrosis. 
uh, MRI or uh, magnetic resonance, uh, resonance in histography can also be used, but the data uh, available on children is limited. So liver biopsy remains the gold standard for diagnosis of NAFLD, assessing severity of NAFLD, degree of fibrosis, and ruling out liver disease. But it's not without its complications and limitations. It's invasive, not fully representative of the liver. And more importantly, it's not suitable for clinical monitoring. We can't do liver biopsies every three to six months to assess um, uh, the response to treatment. Liver biopsy is useful, as I mentioned, to assess liver steatosis and also grade it. Liver injury in the cases of steatohepatitis, hepatocyte ballooning and the fibrosis and cirrhosis in advanced cases. Uh, so if you can just um, do all the bullet points, please. So when to consider liver biopsy? Because it's being invasive, um, it's not recommended to do it for everybody. Some centers uh, do the liver biopsy for all suspected cases of nephilim. But really it's uh, important to consider if ALT or AST are high more than 80, if there is a persistently elevated transaminases and ultrasonographic changes despite uh, treatment for three to six months, children who are younger than 10 years because we have to exclude other causes, evidence of advanced liver disease as part of the disease evaluation, and if there is a family history of severe method. So if liver biopsy is not ideal in uh, monitoring and assessing, there is a need for non-invasive markers that will help us in this process. One of those markers is the caspase-generated cytokeratin-18 fragments, or CK18. This is a byproduct of hepatic apoptosis. Hepatic apoptosis is a prominent feature in children or patients with NASH, and therefore it has been studied and it was found that the plasma levels of CK18 is higher in children with NAFLD compared to um, healthy children or children with normal liver. And also it correlates with disease severity. So children who have uh, steatohepatitis or fibrosis, they have higher CK than the just simple steatosis. Also, there have been markers to assess fibrosis many studies. So one of those markers is the AST to platelet ratio or the ACRI score. And the higher the score, uh, the, the more likely there is fibrosis. The other uh, score is the pediatric NAFLD fibrosis uh, index, which measures three simple parameters, child's age, waist circumference, and triglyceride levels. Values uh, equal or more than nine indicate the presence of fibrosis, whereas values less than three uh, can exclude it. Also, there is the enhanced liver fibrosis test or the ELF test, which uh, measures three extracellular matrix components, including the hyaluronic acid and uh, uh, propeptide of uh, type 3 procollagen. The ELF test of more than 8.49 indicates the presence of fibrosis. So what's the treatment for NAFLD? Treatment should address not only the liver disease, but the entire spectrum of comorbidities. Weight loss and physical activity remains the first option. There have been trials um, looking at different pharmacotherapy, probiotics, and I will discuss this on the later slides. So weight loss. Uh, by both diet and physical activity remains the mainstay of pediatric NAFLD treatment. Weight loss of more than 7%, more than or equal 7%, has shown to improve histological disease activity, and more than 10% to result in NASH resolution and even fibrosis regression. But this required, requires a multidisciplinary approach, including the dietitian, the uh, physiotherapists, the psychological psychologists. An important thing to advise our families and children is to avoid the sugar sweetened beverages, as I mentioned before. You'll be surprised to find out how much they drink of these sugary drinks. The other advice is to try and increase physical activity by limiting screen time to less than two hours a day. 
Now, I'm sure this would be a very difficult advice to follow uh, given the current circumstances and COVID. All the children are at home at the moment and even there is online uh, schooling. So I'm sure we'll see an increase in the nafid after the uh, COVID. What about pharmacotherapy? Um, the TONIC trial, which is a, a multi-center randomized uh, placebo-controlled study looked at the vitamin E of 800 units a day and metformin 500 milligrams twice daily in children between age of uh, 8 to 17 years. And the study has shown a reduction in the level of ALT from the be beginning, uh, uh, from 96 weeks after the treatment compared to the start of the treatment but there was not sustained response. If we want to start children on vitamin E for NAFLD, it's only recommended or um, we should only start it in children who have biopsy proven NASH, not just obesity and abnormal LFTs. We also should counsel the parents that the long-term effect of using vitamin E is unknown. There are other pharmacotherapies that are being tried uh, Currently, other insulin sensitizers, the um, synthetic uh, chemodeoxycholic acid, uh, and there are pediatric trials ongoing at the moment. There have been also uh, trials looking at uh, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids, DHAs, in the treatment of NAFLD, and improvement in liver function and hepatic steatosis has been demonstrated by inhibiting lipogenesis and stimulating fatty acid oxidation. The quality though of this evidence is not sufficient to recommend it or license it for use for method. What about probiotics? I've mentioned about intestinal microbiota being signature and how it affects the, uh, or plays a role in the uh, nephilim pathogenesis. Uh, there were trials looking at using Lactobacillus ramulus and VSL3 for 8 to 16 weeks and improvement in ALT, improvement in steatosis and lipid profile has been demonstrated. What about uh, bariatric surgery in children? It is recommended but only for older children more than 12 years and only if they have a very high BMI of more than 40 or BMI more than 35 with other major comorbidities like type 2 diabetes. So in summary, NAFLD is a leading cause of chronic liver disease in children uh, worldwide. Exclusion of other liver disease is mandatory. There is a strong genetic predisposition, and that's why we see in certain uh, population in race more, but also we can see it in non-obese children. Liver biopsy remains the gold standard but development of non-invasive surrogate marker is required. Management of children requires multidisciplinary care, multidisciplinary approach, screening for genetic predisposition in individuals with risk factors, and personalized care for diagnosis and treatment. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking Professor Murtada Al Shabrawi for his uh, very generous and kind invitation. Uh, I was hoping, as I mentioned in the other lecture, to be uh, physically attending this uh, scientific meeting with you, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I was not able to. Thank you very much for um, listening to uh, to this talk, and I hope uh, that um, it will fulfil what you are expecting out of it by the end of it. Hopefully, uh, we can have uh, also, um, uh, I can answer some of your questions if I'm able to join you live uh, at the time of uh, broadcasting of, uh, of this presentation. Professor Murtada asked me to um, talk about maternal and child outcome of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, in pregnancy. Um, I am not sure actually whether you have already listened to the fetal programming and epigenetic talk or not, um, because some of the information I talked about there will be helpful here. Um, so when it comes to 
the slides related to um, uh, to this point, I might uh, elaborate a little bit more uh, about them here. So apologies if you have listened to some of this information before. Um, it will just be a couple of slides just to put everything in context. So liver disease in pregnancy can either be pregnancy specific, i.e. a complication of the pregnancy itself, or pre-existing. This is a woman who has already a liver problem and currently she is pregnant. The pregnancy specific conditions um, are um, not very many. The most serious of them is acute, um, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, this is um, quite acute from its name. Uh, it is very serious. It can have deleterious effects for the mother and the fetus. However, it is also very rare. Um, the prevalence uh, of AFP seems to range between 1 in 7,000 to 1 in 20,000. So if you have a very busy maternity unit that delivers 10 or 12,000 a year or 15,000 a year, the doctors there might have one case of AFP every one or two years. Hence, if you ask obstetricians, very few of them really would have seen a case of AFP. We think about it a lot, we worry about it a lot, we do investigations for it a lot, but in fact, uh, we rarely we would rarely see it in our professional life. Unless if you are a liver tertiary referral center, uh, then obviously you'll be seeing a lot of them because they're referred from everywhere. The other pregnancy specific condition is what we call HELP, and this HELP has two L's, not one L, and HELP stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. This is something that we see certainly um, a, a lot of in our professional life as obstetricians. It's a complication of preeclampsia and from its name uh, the, these women will have hemolysis, they will have high liver enzymes and they will have low platelets. And the prevalence of this is somewhere between 0.2 and 0.6 percent. So a little bit but much more common than AFP um, and hence we see more of it. And the last uh, one of the pregnancy specific conditions is obstetric cholestasis. Obstetric cholestasis, OC, or intrahepatic uh, cholestasis, uh, or intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, um, they are all one and the same thing. Uh, this is something that happens. Um, uh, it's not uncommon at all. Uh, the incidence is, can be as high as 2%, um, hence, we encounter this in our daily practice a lot. Um, you, you don't really need to do much to find these women because they will find you. Uh, they have, as uh, you all know, um, a lot of itching, it's very distressing. Uh, so they are actually trying to, uh, to get something done about it. It is linked to um, poor pregnancy outcomes and we watch these pregnancies very carefully, particularly uh, fetal growth and development. And a lot of them actually would end up uh, being delivered a little bit early. The pre-existing liver conditions, um, you know about them more than I do, to be honest. It is your specialty, it is your subspecialty, but you can have uh, women who have hepatitis B or C and are pregnant. Um, the prevalence of hepatitis B and C in this situation will depend on uh, the uh, where this woman is um, living, where she comes from, um, her race. Um, so the prevalence range, uh, range is really quite wide. Most of the antenatal uh, programs will factor in some form of screening, either at least for hepatitis B, in some places hepatitis B and C. Um, in some places they do selective hepatitis C screening depending on whether uh, this woman is uh, high risk or not. Autoimmune hepatitis is also another condition. Um, 
what happens to it in pregnancy varies. For some women, it might get better. Uh, for a lot of women, nothing changes. So if they started um, the pregnancy without active um, uh, hepatitis, they probably will carry on without any problems. Uh, but for some pregnancies, uh, there might be a flare. -up. Pre-existing liver cirrhosis, something that we uh, don't really see much of because most of the people who have, most of the women who have uh, cirrhosis will actually uh, have a, a, probably a fertility problem. They would have difficulty um, getting pregnant. Um, so we don't really see many of these. And last but not least, and this is the focus of our talk today, is NAFLD. Now, it is interesting because if you ask obstetricians about liver diseases in pregnancy, they probably will come up with most of the things on this list, certainly the pregnancy-specific ones. But really, very few people will even mention NAFLD. I don't know what's the reason for this. I don't know why we don't know about it. I don't know why we don't think about it. I don't know why there are no national guidelines about it. There is guidance from the RCUG, or College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, about how to deal with with HELP syndrome, about obstetric cholestasis, lots of information about hepatitis B and C, uh, what you do about them, but nothing really much about NAFLD. I discussed the prevalence of all the other conditions with you. However, I don't know whether you are aware that one in four um, people who live on our planet have NAFLD. So the prevalence could be as high as 25%. In fact, the prevalence where you are sitting now in the Middle East is really quite high. It could be a, as high as one in three people have an AFLD. However, the group that we are focusing on are young um, women in the childbearing age. And the prevalence among women between the ages of 20 and 40, roughly speaking, the childbearing age, of course, the childbearing age extends a little bit uh, before 20 and also a little bit after 40. But if we focus on 20 to 40, where the majority of, um, of women who are going to be pregnant um, would, would be of that age, the prevalence is 10%. So one in 10 women who turn up to clinics of obstetricians would potentially have an AFLD. There is a strong association between um, NAFLD and high body mass index. There is also a strong association uh, between it and insulin resistance, uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, so NAFLD and metabolic syndrome seem to be maybe a continuum of one and the same thing. And AFLD is also very linked to a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a condition that we see a lot of in obstetrics and gynecology. Because women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome will have actually quite a, a few different obstetric and gynecological issues for which we will end up seeing them in, a, in one shape or the other. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, women suffering with this condition might be complaining of irregular periods, might be complaining of infertility. And when they are pregnant, the risk of gestational diabetes is much higher. Uh, the risk of miscarriage is higher. The risk of preterm birth is higher. And the risk of pregnancy complications to them and the fetus is also higher. We have to be careful when we talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome because the name is misleading. Uh, although we say polycystic, which implies that there are many cysts in the ovary. In fact, there are no cysts in that ovary. These are the unruptured follicles that we can see on ultrasound scan. So it looks as if they are very small cysts, but there are no cysts. Of course, this is a, a, a condition, a situation where um, some women uh, go away thinking, I have an ovarian cyst. Various is something totally different. This is, uh, this is a, a problem with uh, how things are sometimes named in medicine. It's also important to focus on the word, uh, on the letter S at the end. So this is polycystic ovarian syndrome, not polycystic ovaries full stop. Because a lot of women will have polycystic ovaries. 
In fact, if you start scanning lots of people, about one in five women will have features on ultrasound scan, looking as if they have polycystic ovaries. But they have regular periods, they get pregnant very quickly, they don't have any problem. Women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome will have the ultrasound scan features suggestive of these small cysts in the periphery of the ovary. And on top of this, they need to have at least two other clinical manifestations. Either high body mass index, hirsutism, infertility, irregular periods. So if you have the polycystic ovary zone scan plus at least two of the other symptoms, then you can say this is a PCOS. Why am I spending that much time talking about PCOS? Um, PCOS is um, a situation which seems to be um, linked to um, hyperinsulinemia. Um, this hyperinsulinemia um, it seems to be happening because of high levels of androgens. So in polycystic ovarian syndrome, these women have very high levels of uh, testosterone. Uh, this hyperandrogenemia um, causes hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia then alters the steroid hormones, increases the production of androgens, and the excessive androgen would increase the insulin resistance and so on and so forth. So you go into this vicious circle of events. It is reported that 40 to 50% of women with PCOS have also an AFLD. And this seems to be independent of whether their body mass index is high or not. It is suggested that the reason for this association um, might be related to, um, again, the altered hormonal profile, particularly the hyperinsulinemia. So this hyperinsulinemia might cause obesity, might cause diabetes, certainly is one of the features of metabolic syndrome, which are all um, very interlinked constituents of NAFLD. NAFLD has lots of negative implications on the pregnancy. It almost, almost triples the risk of gestational diabetes for the woman who has NAFLD. Her risk of preeclampsia in pregnancy doubles. Her risk of cesarean section is high. Of course, you will notice this in countries where the risk of cesarean section is normal or low. I know in Egypt it's different because a lot of people have cesarean sections anyway, so you might not notice that. The risk of preterm birth is high. And again, I want you to, if you have listened to the talk about fetal programming, it's important to always think about the impact of what happens to the fetus in development, whether it's born early or born small, on outcome later on in life. It's not only about what's going to happen in a month and coming out of the neonatal unit and everything is absolutely fine. Because we have to reduce the risk of, of these problems if we want to improve the outcome for populations in the future. And it doubles the risk of low birth weight. So NAFLD really has quite serious implications on pregnancy. Hackstrom and his team have actually um, generated this um, calculation for the crude and the adjusted relative risk uh, of different uh, pregnancy complications in relation to ANFLD when you're comparing it to PCOS. I talked about PCOS, it's something every obstetrician knows about, women know about, we worry about, we do lots of things about, but we don't do much about NAFLD. Actually, in fact, we do nothing about NAFLD. When the implications of NAFLD are higher than PCOS. So when you compare women who have PCOS to NAFLD, the risk I've mentioned in the previous slide, the risk of NAFLD compared to normal women. But when you look even at the comparison of the risk of gestational diabetes in NFLD patients compared to PCOS without NAFLD, the relative risk is one and a half folds higher. For preeclampsia, it's almost two times higher compared to PCOS. And so on and so forth for 
different pregnancy complications. Why as obstetricians, we respect and worry about PCOS and deal with it and give patients lots of advice and we do nothing about NFLD, I don't know. But it's something that is important for us to uh, really address in the future. <coughs> now I want to um, move on to the fetus rather than the mother. Uh, we have agreed that NFLD and metabolic syndrome seems to be a continuum. Uh, the line of demarcation between, uh, between these two conditions is quite hazy. They seem to move from one to the other um, quite easily. We know that metabolic syndrome, certainly in the mother, is a reason for macrosomia to the baby. This is a high birth weight. Uh, it, microsomia is associated with shoulder dystocia. This is when the shoulders get stuck at the time of childbirth. It can cause significant birth traumas to the baby with sometimes long-term negative consequences. And of course, to the mother equally with problems to her pelvic floor. It is uh, a cause of neonatal hypoglycemia um, because the baby is set to high um, glucose levels and, once, uh, and, and of course has high insulin when the baby is born, uh, there is a risk for this. And there is also a risk for respiratory distress. But these are risks that we, we all in a way know about. However, there is also an increased risk for this baby developing NAFLD as a growing fetus. These are some experiments that have been done by different groups, either in humans or in animal models, particularly in mice. Experiments have observed that there is increased chance of, of having intracellular hepatic fats in fetuses that are sadly stillborn who died in utero to diabetic mothers, irrespective of whether these mothers were obese or not. When they did post-mortem examination of them, a lot of these babies will have intracellular hepatic fat. Also in mice models where they induced maternal insulin resistance model, irrespective of whether the actual glucose level was high or not, or whether these mice were overweight or not, again, their offspring, the, the risk of having intracellular hepatic fat was much higher. We know that infants born to obese mothers with gestational diabetes mellitus also have increased risk of having intracellular hepatic fat. There are also situations which increase the risk of the offspring developing NAFLD later on in life. These are in experiments. So babies that are growth restricted, intrafine growth restricted, or babies who are macrosomic, those who are overweight, so underweight and overweight are both problems. These babies, the risk of de developing NAFLD later on in life, as we will see later on in the slide, is high. Also, if, and this is in animal models, in experimental models, if animals are exposed to high fat diet, the risk of their offspring having NAFLD and even NASH is higher. So why does this happen? Something happens for this developing fetus that would increase the risk of either being born with intracellular hepatic fat or developing it later on in life. Is this just merely the transfer of fat across the placenta that is causing this problem? Or is it a problem related to fetal programming? <coughs> if you have listened to my fetal programming talk, you know what I'm talking about. If not, then I'm going to uh, mention a couple of things just to help with the, the understanding of, of these slides. And hopefully when you listen to the other talk, things will make more sense. Epigenetics are changes that are inherited from one generation to the other. And these are changes that happen on top of our genome that change how our genes function, whether they get expressed or suppressed without changing any gene sequence or any DNA sequence. In my other talk, I talked about different mechanisms of epigenetic control. I'm going to mention three of them here very briefly because the three are in fact linked to an AFLD. One of them is a process called DNA methylation where 
methyl groups get attached to the cytosine within our DNA, and this is causes genes to be switched off. In fact, studies have shown that hepatic DNA in um, patients who have NAFLD is demethylated. <laughs> in the previous talk, I've mentioned that if you have methyl groups added to cytosine, this causes genes to be switched off. If you have genes that are demethylated, this means they are switched on. But switching on a gene is not always something good. If this gene is a bad gene, that might be causing fat deposition or causing cancer or causing aging or whatever. The other process is histone modification. And I've mentioned before, histones are the proteins around which our DNA is, um, is wrapped to be wrapped tightly, which makes genes uh, not expressed or wrapped loosely and, make, and this makes them expressed. Again, these histones seems to be modified in patients who have NAFLD. It's not clear at the moment whether this happens secondly to, again, alteration in methylation, or whether it happens because of the third mechanism, which is something called microRNA. <coughs> microRNA is um, another uh, mechanism. It's a little bit more complex. It seems to influence um, what, happens in, um, what happens epigenetically um, and the microRNA are um, short segments, only of 22 nucleotides of RNA uh, that seem to be transcribed from areas in our genome that does not carry a code for a particular protein or any function. So they are non-coding regions. And this, these short uh, RNAs seem to be formed and they seem to also uh, have certain places they attach themselves to called targets and by attaching themselves to these places they can switch genes on or off. In NAFLD, the structure of these microRNAs gets modulated and this dysregulated form of miRNA, when it attaches itself to the target, it causes a different effect. So something that was supposed to be switched on might be switched off and vice versa. There is no doubt that there is a genetic predisposition for NAFLD. And Dr. Abdel Hadi has already alluded to, um, uh, to uh, this information in her talk. However, in addition to the genetic um, predisposition, there seem to be epigenetic environmental factors that happen around the developing fetus, which are precipitating factors that facilitate or increase the risk of the development of NAFLD and, um, and even NASH in the future. Is it doom and gloom? Is there something we can do about all this? Or is it just a fact that this is our destiny to just be programmed and whatever happens to us in utero, we will suffer with it later on in life or not? Of course, it's not doom and gloom. And there are lots of things uh, that we can, uh, we can do, either as pediatricians or as obstetricians. This is a neat experiment done by Zhu and his colleagues. And they, it, it's an experiment on mice. And they had the, these mice arranged in four groups. Group one were mice that were fed high fat diet. From the beginning of the experiment, until these female mice got pregnant, lactated, and, um, and then they assessed their offsprings for the level of hepatic steatosis, um, for any abnormal blood lipids, and for any abnormal hepatic free fatty acids. For group two, it was um, similar. They did the same tests, but these, this group was fed a normal fat diet. Then they had group three, which were fed high fat diet. And one week before the pregnancy, they put them on normal fat diet and carried on till the end of the experiment. And the last group is the group that really we are interested in. have had high fat diet, but nine weeks before their pregnancy, they switched them to a normal fat diet and carried on with the experiment. 
the abnormalities in the hepatic steatosis and blood lipids, as well as hepatic free fatty acids, <coughs> was only observed in groups one and three. The one who had high fat diet throughout, and the ones who had, had, had high fat diet, and they had the normal diet only one week before the pregnancy, so they didn't have time for things to stabilize. However, if people eat, uh, if these animals were fed normal uh, fat diet, or even if they had bad habits, but they were switched to a, a good diet a few weeks before the pregnancy, the outcome seemed to be fine. What is more compelling is, um, is this birth cohort called the Rene birth cohort. This is a birth cohort in Australia of uh, nearly 3,000 live-born children who were followed up for many years. In fact, they, are follow they were followed up in this report for 17 years. When they were adolescents, they looked, they assessed their liver, and they were able to diagnose that NAFLD was diagnosed or developed in just about 15% of them, 1,170 adolescents at the age of 17. This is a very controlled group because they know the condition when they are adolescents, but they also have a lot of information about their mother's pre-pregnancy situation, their pregnancies, as well as um, uh, their development as children. And interestingly, um, the factors that seem to be independent predictors to their risk for NAFLD were the duration of how long they were breastfed. And this seemed to, if they, the longer they were breastfed, the risk of NAFLD reduced significantly. The risk of pre-pregnancy maternal obesity seemed to increase the risk of NAFLD quite a lot, to one hour, almost one hour fold. But also the risk of childhood obesity was really the biggest factor for their development of NAFLD. I want to focus on breastfeeding, which is something that um, you probably are aware of, um, but I want to stress the impact of, uh, of that when it comes to NFLD. Breastfeeding has lots of maternal benefits, contrary to what people might believe. Um, it actually reduces post-pregnancy weight, and some people sometimes are overweight and they blame uh, the fact that um, you know, they're breastfeeding. Supposedly, it, it shouldn't really do this. It should reduce um, the, the post-pregnancy weight. It certainly helps with uh, reducing glucose and triglycerides. It improves insulin sensitivity. Uh, it reduces BMI and waist circumference. Um, so um, these are all really uh, important um, issues for the mother. But for the offspring, it also has lots of benefits. It reduces the rate of childhood obesity. It reduces the rate of diabetes later on in life. It certainly seemed to be uh, linked to the development of NAFLD and NASH. This is a graph from uh, the paper regarding this uh, Rainy cohort I was talking about. And you can see here, um, this is the risk of uh, an AFLD in relation to uh, the duration of breastfeeding when any supplementary milk was introduced and one solid food was introduced. And so there is no, and although there is no association or there does not seem to be an association, association between um, solid food and the risk of NFLD. You can see that the risk of NFLD reduces significantly with the longer duration of uh, breastfeeding and the delay in introducing any supplementary milk. So, we talked about lots of vicious circles and this is just another vicious circle that includes quite a few things. A mother having NFLD or metabolic syndrome, and both are interchangeable, or gestational diabetes. This leads to maternal dysglycemia. And this abnormal um, glycemic control can cause fetal hyperglycemia. It causes excessive growth linked to the hyperinsulinemia, but it can also cause hepatic steatosis. This is very much linked to obesity in the offspring and they themselves developing metabolic syndrome. These children with 
high risk of metabolic syndrome and AFLD will end up being obese adults with high risk of diabetes and NFLD. And these adults, at least the women of them, will be mothers again, who will carry on with the same risk. So in my opinion, if we are to do something, these are the points of intervention that we can do something about. This is for you as a pediatrician, as pediatricians, and this is for us as obstetricians. We need to make sure that mothers who embark on pregnancy are as, health, as healthy as they could be before they get pregnant, even if this means delaying the pregnancy for a few months or maybe a year until you get them to their best body mass index. Make sure they have good supplementation and make sure that they are at a, a best health status because this is the only way they can reduce the risk for their children ending up in their situation in the future. This talk is really quite pertinent because NAFLD is a condition that is here and it is staying with us for a while. This is a, a modeling um, study that was under, undertaken by Estes and, and, uh, and his colleagues. And it's based on an assumption, assuming that, um, that obesity and diabetes mellitus level off, which obviously is not the case and will not be the case because as a population in general, globally, we are getting bigger um, size-wise. <coughs> but assuming that obesity and diabetes don't change, there might be still a modest increase in NAFLD, uh, maybe up to 30%. But what's more serious is the prevalence of NASH. This will continue to increase significantly because of the people who already have NAFLD. This is the prediction over the next 10 years. And what's much more serious is that mortality from liver problems and advanced liver disease will more than double as well. <coughs> so in conclusion, pre-pregnancy healthy diet is of utmost importance. It's absolutely essential to try and control any hyperglycemia antenatally. And we have to do every single measure we have to prevent the GDM, gestational diabetes mellitus, and to be able to, if we can't prevent it, at least to diagnose it early and manage it properly. We have to avoid excess weight gain during pregnancy. This concept that this mother is eating for two um, is totally incorrect. The baby is going to get what it needs, um, and actually the baby does not need that much. Actually, if anything, the baby needs healthy um, stuff. Not, not too much of, of, of the food. We have to try and encourage lactation for more than six months. Women need to understand the benefits of that for themselves, but also for their babies. <clears throat> it would be interesting in the future to see the potential role of insulin sensitizing agents like metformin, for example, in pregnancies in women that have metabolic syndrome. We look at this in the context of outcomes for PCOS and certainly it improves outcomes in pregnancy. And we look at it in the context of um, diabetes in pregnancy. But to be interesting to see the impact of this on the development of NAFLD and NASH uh, for the future of the offsprings. And last but not least, an area that is very close to my heart in my other talk about, I talked about preconception preconceptual folic acid supplementation. It's a, a very important source of methyl groups. We talked about the fact that, that uh, there seems to be DNA demethylation, hypomethylation in NAFLD. I wonder actually um, uh, what the impact of preconception folate supplementation would be on the offspring uh, of mothers who are known to have NAFLD, whether it reduces the risk of their fetuses or not. But this is really, um, would be quite an interesting experiment. Thank you very much for listening.